Hello, hello, hello guys and welcome back to Joe's Ventures and today we're doing another episode of our Planet Zoom Mod Spotlight. So this will be part 89, so we're nearing on the big 90, and then from there it's only 10 more until uh, big 100. So 100 parts of these mod spotlights, that's wild to think about so many mods being made. But um, anyway, this is where we of course have a look at all the uh, wonderful mods people have been making and use them to talk about and learn about the wonderful di biodiversity that we share our world with. So uh, yeah, today we've got quite a lot of fish today, so I thought I'd put a lot of fish in this one and then part 90 will release the day after potentially, and then we'll have uh, some really cool animals, some extinct animals, things like that, we'll get into that, it'll be quite awesome. But um, yeah, we're going to be starting off today with um, the Kenji, or the Kenny, Kenji cichlid. Or the Kenyi cichlid, I believe you say that, from Leaf, Buffsu, and Printable Models. Let's see if we can have a look at our little friends right here coming up for a feed. Or we'll have a look at them anyway. So really cool little guys. This is by Leaf, Buffsu, and Printable Models, as I um, already said. So these guys, as I mentioned, are a type of cichlid. Actually, their um, genus name, Melandia, is actually in honor of the German ichthyologist Hans J. Meyland. So that's a cool little reference to them. So these guys are a freshwater fish, they typically like a pH range of like 8, and they typically live in depths from between 6 and 30 meters, and they live in tropical waters uh, from about 24 to 26 degrees, and they are endemic to the Minbenji Island, Lake Malawi, uh, in um, that area there in Africa, and they've been introduced to Namalenji Island, and they're not a particularly large fish, so I imagine like these guys are not quite as big as most fish that we've been talking about here a bit of a smaller one but still really awesome regardless these guys uh, maximum length about 8.7 centimeters of male or unsexed and in terms of how they live these guys inhabit uh, the sediment rich regions and often are found over sa sandy or uh, muddy patches between the rocks and they're abundant in waters uh, under 10 meters uh, and they feed typically on brushing the loose algae off of rocks and also on plankton and open water. So a little bit of a generalist in that regard. So algae and plankton. Um, males are actually quite territorial and they exhibit uh, territoriality over sand dune nests. And females, uh, juveniles and non-territorial adult males will often occur singly or in small groups. With all males having one eye spot on their anal fin as you can see here. There's a little eye spot there. Very, very interesting. Um, in terms of the life cycle, these guys are mouth brooders. So males will adorn one egg spot on their anal fin, which mimics eggs, and apparently functions to lure the females to pick up this um, egg, which enables fertilization for the rest of the eggs being brooded in the female's mouth. And actually, in one experimental study, females are attracted to males with one large egg spot more than those with numerous tiny ones covered in the same area. So that's a cool little fact about them. So... Um, Another really cool thing about these guys, uh, females tend to be uh, this color. The males tend to be a little bit more brighter as well. Uh, they're highly sexual dimorphic, which isn't really shown here, sadly. So uh, these guys, uh, the female and juvenile males are pale white with these blue bands. The female, uh, the adult males are actually bright yellow with faint brown bands. And they're actually quite common in the aquarium hobby as well. So uh, people like to keep them. And in terms of their... Um, conservation status these guys are considered least concerned so they're not really in a danger of being uh, becoming extinct but as i mentioned they are kind of uh kept in the aquarium hobby and bred and taken sometimes for the aquarium hobby but yeah really really awesome animals cute little guys here to maybe don't have the true sexual dimorphism there should be like a bright yellow male but speaking of bright yellow we've got another mod another cichlid from the uh leaf buff sue and printable models we've got the electric yellow cichlid so this could be your substitute uh male adult male if you wanted so another really cool little fish here so the electric yellow cichlid is an uh cichlid endemic to the central western coastal regions of lake malawi which is in east africa uh they're also known as the yellow um lemon yellow lab or the blue str uh streak hab or the electric yellow or yellow prince which depends on the color morph sometimes and a naturally occurring yellow colored variant from lion's cave is actually one of the most popular types of among hobbyists in the aquariums uh hobby uh, aquarium hobbyists 
So these guys typically live in water with a pH of 7.8 to 8.9 and our ideal temperature range is between 23 and 26 degrees, so 73 to 78 degrees Fahrenheit. And these guys can get quite big, a large male can reach about 15 centimeters in length. Uh, in terms of reproduction, these guys are uh, mouth brooders, uh, maternal mouth brooders, that means the eggs are carried and hatched in the mother's mouth and they're about three weeks. The fish are um, overfiles and the males will um, ex uh, kind of excavate a pit in their sand within this territory where the female will lay the eggs and then the female then takes the eggs into her mouth for fertilization which is pretty interesting so in terms of the ecology these guys are pretty peaceful compared to other cichlids to keep in aquariums and they're best kept with spe specialist cichlids and they should not be be um, kept in freshwater communities with them um, such as neon tetras and things like that because they can get nipped on um, in the aquarium setting, they have a natural habitat of rocks and caves and should have a sandy substrate. They're kind of like that. And their diet consists mostly of prepared um, cichlid pellets uh, and flakes supplemented with krill, broodworms, things like that uh, for adults. But in the wild, I believe they have quite a similar diet to the Kenyai cichlids. So these guys would be eating kind of algae, things like that. Really, really awesome. Cool little fishy. And... Um, yeah, in terms of their conservation, they're considered least concerned, so there's no worry about these guys being extinct. And being quite a common aquarium fish, uh, they're quite common to get if you want one. Uh, in freshwater tanks, things like that, are really, really awesome. So these two were both done by Leaf and Buffsu with printable models, uh, ported in. So now we're moving on to some really other weird and wacky fish. This next one's from Leaf, Buffsu and Fishing Planet, so the next few are going to be ports from Fishing Planet. We've got here the Double Trunk... Uh, elephant fish really really interesting fish over here if you have a look look at this wacky fellow so their scientific name is camp uh campylomyris rhino conforus i believe you say that so these guys are a type of um momyridae fish so these are african weekly ele uh, electric fishes so a really interesting group of fish that includes the cornish jack that i mentioned earlier uh though they're quite distantly related uh these guys at a maximum size can get about 22 centimeters in length uh in total length so from the tip of their snout to the kind of the end of their tail and in terms of their habitat and ecology these guys are a dimensional species and they actually possess electrical electrical receptors over the entire head and ventral surface and dorsal regions of their body but they're absent from the side and the caudal um, penuncle uh, where the electric organ is located and these guys are mentioned a freshwater fish they're typically like a um, ph range of five and luckily these guys aren't considered too much uh, in danger they're widespread and there's not that many threats in central africa where these guys live so they're considered least concerned they're quite widely um sparse they'd be found in the congo lots of places like that very very common widespread fish in africa they're not too much is known about them at least i can't find that much information on them i don't really can't really tell you much about their diet they're not a very potentially well uh studied fish uh, there's just not enough information on them really but really really awesome species if i do say so myself i really love their face they've got this really interesting face and look at that long nose and they're and a g their genus uh the um campy pylomomyris are actually there's a group of them about 14 species and they look all quite similar to each other but this is the particular double tusk one so really really awesome so um yeah that's uh leaf buff zoo fishing planet next one's also done by leaf buff zoo and fishing planet we've got the european grayling or just the grayling so this is another really cool little fish uh we've got going on here so this is the european grayling as i mentioned uh these guys are a freshwater fish in the family um seminidae and the only species in the genus uh native to europe and they're closely related to the arctic grayling which i've mentioned a while ago uh, these guys are native to Europe and they're widespread from the United Kingdom and France to the Ural Mountains in Russia and the Balkans But they have been introduced to places such as Morocco, but they do not have uh, But they haven't really established there, but there is some introduced populations in some areas where they're not really uh, Native to so these guys can get quite big. They reach a maximum length of about uh, 60 centimeters or 24 inches and a maximum recorded weight of 6.7 grams or 15 pounds and typically they're told apart by the similar arctic grayling by the presence of like five to eight dorsal uh, and three to four anal spines 
which is absent in the other species. And these guys generally prefer cold, clean, running riverine water that occurs in lakes and especially in brackish waters across the Baltic Sea. These guys are also omnivores, so these guys will eat on vegetable matter as well as crustaceans, insects, spiders, mollusks, zooplankton, and smaller fish. That includes some things like Eurasian minnows. And they're also prey for larger fish, for the um, huachin, which is another large salmon fish. So yeah, they're kind of uh, meso predators in that regard, or they're kind of mid-level in the food chain, they're the omnivores. Um, they're actually quite uh, important economically as well, as they're commonly raised as like a fish for sport. And they're known as the lady of the stream and have been pursued by anglers for the false perception is that they stop trout colonizing rivers, but that's obviously not true as they feed on different prey items. And they can be fished through um, cause fishing season from 16th of June to 14th of May, where they are caught on the fly. So they're caught with like the same way you pretty much catch um, salmon. And well-known um, grayling finds include the grayling witch and things like that. Lots of nymphs they tend to take like that. Uh, the method includes uh, takes a lot of these nymphs under the tip of the fly rod and then put them under the water and entice the grayling in. And in France, the sp uh, season is limited due to several factors. And they're one of the rare places in Europe where the common grayling occurs in natural habitat in the Allure, I believe you say that. So um, in terms of their uh, conservation, these guys are considered uh, protected in the Burn Conservancy and are critically endangered in the Baltic Sea. But overall, they're considered least concern, which is good. And the term grayling is often used for this guy and the um, uh, European grayling, since there's many um, obscure like synonyms of the species. Or obsolete you could say and the generic name comes from the greek thine smell which is a name that's derived from the fragrance of wild thyme which these guys are believed to sell smell similar to so that's kind of where their genus name comes from so that's a really interesting little fact about these guys a really cool little um european grayling a uh, big fan big big fan so we're moving on this is also done by leaf buffs Food fishing planet moving on we've got another cool species here we've got the european eel so another awesome guy here. So the European eel, um, these guys are a species of eel that are normally about 60 to 80 centimeters long or about 2 to 2.6 feet. And they uh, can reach more than a meter or 3 feet and can sometimes reach for uh, like 4 foot 11 or 1.5 meters in extreme cases. So these guys are, um, in terms of life history, these guys, we didn't actually know a lot about them for a while. But um, unlike many other migratory fish, they begin their life cycle in the ocean and then spend most of their life inland, and then they go out to the ocean to spawn. So, as when they approach the coast after being born, these guys will have a transparent larval stage, which are commonly called glass eels, as they enter estuaries, and then they start migrating upstream. And then after entering this, entering this habitat, they metamorphize into elvers, which are pretty much mini versions of the adults, as you can kind of see here. And as the eels grow, that become known as the yellow eel because they have a brownish yellow color to the side of their bellies. And after about 15 to 20 years of living in fresh or brackish water, these eels will become sexually mature. Their eyes will grow larger and their flanks become uh, silver. And their bellies will become more white in color. And they kind of, as I mentioned, look kind of look like this. This is when they become the silver eel stage. And then they begin their migration back to the Sangasso Sea to spawn. And the silver ring is very important in the eel's development because it allows for um, the increased levels of the steroid hormone cortisol, which is needed for their migration back into the fresh from the fresh water to the sea. The cortisol actually plays a role in long migrations because it allows for the mobilization of energy during that migration. And they also play a key role in silvering because they produce um, the steroid 11 ketotesterone, which uh, prepares the eel for the structural changes in the skin to endure the migration as they transition from salt water, um, fresh water to salt water, which is really, really cool. So, yeah, in terms of that uh, ecology, uh, they're pretty awesome and we learned a lot about them. And but they are sadly, as I mentioned, uh, as I'm going to mention, they are critically endangered. So they're a critically endangered species because since the 1970s, the number of eels in Europe has declined up to 90 percent and possibly even 98 percent. And this is due to quite a few factors that include overfishing, parasites, uh, hydroelectric dams and natural clay, uh, um, changes such as the Gulf Stream, the North Atlantic Drift and the North Atlantic Inclusion, which has happened. And also another issue that could be a factor is pollution by PCBs uh, and um, there's been a lot of uh, effort to try and uh, protect them. 
So uh, in 2010, Greenpeace added these guys on the seafood res uh, red list and um, kind of said it don't really eat them if you can avoid it and they're, but they're, luckily they're in terms of breeding programs there are people trying to conserve them and as the population has been falling for some time there have been some conservation projects to try breeding them within 1997 the innovative network in the netherlands uh, initiated a project to breed them in captivity and by um, stimulating the six and a half thousand journey um, from europe to the serengoso sea with a swimming machine for the fish which is pretty interesting they managed to achieve some successes uh, through a combination of fresh and salt water as well as hormones they were able to breed in captivity in 2006 and the larvae survived four and five days after hatching and they were able to set records in 2007 with them living up to 12 days and at this age they um, use the larval sac and then their mouth and digestive channel have developed so they require feeding and attempts with various different substances such as deep water sampling and uh, presumed habitat uh, was performed to try and find what they were eating and the results indicated that these guys would be eating various planktonic or very small organisms but also things like microscopic jellyfish and there's also been lots of research to um by other groups as well to try and uh, help breed them in captivity so they can supplement the wild populations in 2014 uh the eels lived for about 20 to 22 days after they hatched, but a full life cycle has still not really been achieved in captivity, so that's something a lot of people are working on. And I think this would be really helpful for the species, not only because uh, animals could be released into the wild to supplement the wild population, which has declined up to 90% or more, they could also create uh, fisheries that in um, aquaculture and farm them so the wild population wouldn't be prosecuted as much and then potentially help with other issues such as um, parasites and uh, hydroelectric dams and things like that that could help them. PCBs is another issue for these guys. So yeah, critically endangered though, which is very sad, but luckily there are lots of people trying to help them because they are a food fish. But yeah, really, really awesome to see these guys at Planet Zoo and a really cool conservation story to see people trying to breed uh, eels in captivity, which is really hard considering their migrations. But yeah, keep going, all you people. I really want to see some captive um, uh, eels uh, bred and um, farmed for food, which would be awesome. So now we're moving on from Europe. We're going down into the uh, Indo-Pacific Ocean. We've got here the green chromos, uh, chrom chromius, I believe you say that. So really, really awesome little fish here, the green chromius. These guys are a type of damselfish. And you can see here they've got uh, iridescent apple green and light blue color to them. And they actually are not too big. They get about a maximum length of about 10 centimeters long. Uh, so these guys uh, are also called the blue-green chromos, but they, it may also refer to the chroma, another related species, the blue puller, and sometimes they are considered conspecific. But these guys have quite a wide range. They're typically found in the Indo-Pacific. That includes the Red Sea. So they can be found in the Indian Ocean, the Red Sea, from Madagascar, Sri Lanka, the Maldives, Australia, uh, New Zealand, New Caledonia, Hawaii, Polynesia, parts of the Pacific Ocean, the Gulf of Mexico, and the Galapagos Islands. So they're quite widely ranged in that regard. And they live in coral reefs and lagoons. Uh, and individuals are usually encountered at depths between 1 to 12 meters. So they're not a very deep uh, fish species. They tend to hang out in um, uh, shallowish water in the lagoons and coral reefs where they like to live. So adults, as I mentioned, can get about up to 10 centimeters or 3.9 inches long at their maximum length. They also have 12 dorsal rays, 9 to 11 soft dorsal rays, 2 anal spines, and 9 to 11 anal soft rays on their fins. And they're a blue-green fish, but they are breeding. Uh, males would turn a little bit more yellowish, just to indicate the breeding. In terms of their diet, these guys uh, feed on phytoplankton, zooplankton, copepods, algae, amphipods, things like that. That makes up the diet of the fish in the wild. And they actually feed on the eggs that fail to hatch as well. And they feed by jaw ramming, uh, ram jawing, I mean. And they tend to live in coral heads as well, which is pretty cool in these cool little schools. Um, in marine aquariums, they're usually kept in small groups of odd numbers. And they're relatively inexpensive to keep, with a small school needing about 110 litres or 29 gallons. But a single specimen can be kept up to 38 litres or 10 US gallons. So some aquariums have successfully bred them in activity as well in terms of home aquariums. So um, 
In terms of reproduction, these guys will tend to spawn over sand and rubble. Uh, the male will prepare, uh, prepare the nests, which are shared by several females. The nest is located on the sand or rubble, and during spawning, the males will turn to more yellowish color, and the large number of eggs that are laid by these multiple females will hatch in about two to three days. Uh, the males will guard the nest and ventilates it with its fins, and then feeding on those eggs that do not hatch. The males will feed on unhatched eggs to prevent them from uh, becoming a breeding ground for microorganisms which rich uh, their lives and also the babies. So they eat the ones so they potentially just don't rot and don't become a good uh, habitat for mic uh, microorganisms. So that's really, really cool. An awesome fish. They are considered, I believe, least concerned. But things like coral bleaching, uh, which is happening to coral reefs across the world with... Uh, really, really bad um, things. Also, uh, collecting for the aquarium trade that they have been success successfully bred. There is always the illegal trade, which hurts their populations. But luckily, they're considered so widespread and so common that they're considered least concerned. So another really awesome fish that we get to talk about. I do like myself a green chromos. So next, we're moving on to another really cool fish here. We've got the golden tail angelfish, also known as the air spot angelfish. Uh, the green chromos is, before I move on, was done by F Leaf Buff Sue and Free 3D. So this gold tail angelfish was done by Armored Interactive Leaf and Buff Sue. So uh, multiples, many multiples. So these cool little guys here are a species of raven fish. They're a type of angelfish, uh, similar to the threadfin angelfish and things like that I've covered before. And they show more similarities between the adults and juveniles than most other members of this species. The juveniles have a blackish brown body marked with many white vertical bands. And the face is paler and more orangey than the body. And they also have this yellow caudal fin here, as you can see. And they develop this white bar on the caudal penuptial, as you can kind of see here. Uh, both adult and juveniles will have that black spot there, though. And the difference is between they have a dark face and their white bar during the coral um, penuptial. And they reach a maximum length of about 33 centimeters or 13 inches. But yeah, really, really interesting look to them. You can see the really beautiful colors that they've got. The white bands and the dark and the yellowish on the face. A very, very beautiful looking fish. In terms of their distribution, these guys are typically found in the Western Indian Ocean around the Gulf of Aden and um, south of the coast of Eastern Africa. They can also be found in the Seychelles, Madagascar and the Koromo Islands. Uh, these guys are typically fed uh, or found at depths of about 1 to 30 meters or 3 to 98 feet where they live in shallow reefs that have rich coral growths, uh, growths of coral or rocky reefs. The diet of the adults is um, very similar for most uh, angelfish. They feed things on like uh, crustaceans, sponges and tourniquets. But uh, zooplankton uh, as well, they'll eat those. But um, juveniles, which are found in much shallower water, will consume large quantities of algae. And the biology of the species is otherwise not that well known. So really, really awesome species there. I just love how beautiful they look. Got these really beautiful colors. The blue face and the black and white bands and the yellow on there. The bluish tints to most of their fins. I think it really looks beautiful. So um, yeah, these guys are often uh, and frequently collected for the um, aquarium trade, but they do not often make it to market. And most um, commercially available specimens will come from Kenya. But they, so they are collected infrequently, but they often do not make it because um, shipping them and stuff like that can be pretty stressful for the fish. And they are considered least concern. So they are luckily doing quite well in their range. So that's pretty good. Really, really awesome. So next up, we've got our second to last species. Uh, we have got the long comb uh, sawfish also known as the green sawfish as kind of mentioned here another really awesome animal down here so the uh these type of sawfish is uh found in the tropical and subtropical waters of the um, indo-pacific and are now sadly considered critically endangered as i'll get into so these guys are potentially the largest species of um, sawfish. They reach a total length of about 7.3 meters or about 24 feet, but they really get more than six meters today. And you can see their greenish olive bodies where they get the name, the green sawfish, with their underparts being quite whitish as you can kind of see here. So the combination of these characters, uh, to distinguish it from the other sawfish is that they have teeth near the base of their rostrum, unlike the knife tooth sawfish. They have a few other different characteristics that really uh, uh, tell them apart from the other uh, species. They have a slightly uh, longer rostrum, relatively short do do uh, dorsal fins and things like that. And the greenish color is another great way to tell them apart. And it's believed that they may have come into contact with other species such as the small tooth um, sawfish, which has been extirpated from the country of South Africa. 
So in terms of their habitat, these guys are typically found at the tropical and subtropical waters of the Indo-Pacific. Historically, they range from South Africa, north to the Red Sea, around the Persian Gulf, um, east to the South China Sea, throughout Southeast Asia and to Australia. And in Australia, it ranged from Shark Bay, although in the northern part of the country and south of Jervis Bay, uh, on the eastern coast. Today, it has disappeared from most of its range, sadly, about um, most of its range. And they live in col uh, colder waters than its relatives, as evidenced by its range in Australia, which occurs much more further south than most other species of sawfish. In terms of their diet, these guys are mainly found in coastal, marine, uh, mangrove, and estuarine uh, habitats, uh, even in this quite shallow water. And they're typically found far offshore in depths of more than 70 meters, but the records of rivers far inland as well, but they're not frequent in uh, freshwater. And they're mainly found in places with a bottom that consists of sand, mud, or silt that allows them to go through and figure out and things like that, so that's really cool. Well, they, these guys typically feed on fish, crustaceans, and mollusks, and they thresh their rostrum, or their long nose here, from side to side to dislodge the prey from the seabed, and then they stun the groups of fish. And all sawfish, even though they look gnarly with the big saw there, they're typically harmless to humans, except when they're captured, and they can cause serious injuries when they defend themselves with their saw. But if you guys leave them alone, they will leave you alone. They're not like a come after you kind of animal uh there's not very much known about their life cycle but they're over viviparous so that means the babies are born um they have eggs inside held inside the body and then are born so they have young and when they're about when they're born they get about 60 to 108 centimeters or 24 to 43 inches long uh they're often said to be 12 in each litter but the basis of this number is kind of unclear with uh, ranging between 1 to 20 in different other species of sawfish the females tend to give birth in inshore areas and then the young stay near the coast and in the estuaries for the first part of their lives uh, they typically reach sexual maturity at about nine years of age they're quite a long-lived fish and they reach a length of about 3.4 to 3.8 meters or 11 to 12 feet at maturity so that's when they become sexually mature the maximum age is unknown but they might live in in, uh, in excess of 50 years with an individual caught as a juvenile live up to 35 years in an aquarium so they're quite um long-lived fish which actually really does not help with their population declines as we'll get into very sadly and as i mentioned these guys like to hang out in fresh water sometimes in australia so that kind of creates a little bit of a refuge for them, it seems. Uh, these guys have declined drastically and are considered um, critically endangered because of um, their fins and saw, which are sold for both sark fin soup and um, novelty items, are highly va uh, vo uh, valuable, with other parts being used in Asian Chinese medicines and the meat being eaten. That's really hurt the populations. And fishing is the main threat, but they're also um, threatened by habitat loss. And because the potential threat... Uh, they pose to the uh, humans they sometimes killed before they are bought on boat when accidentally caught and because of the saw all sawfish are particularly prone to getting entangled in nets as well so that really sucks historically they were quite common in uh, about 37 countries but have been extirpated from two and possibly extirpated from another 24 that leaves only 11 countries in their reign range and in terms of this area that means they only certainly survive in about 62 percent of their historical range and the total population is believed to um declined more than 80 percent over the past three generations there is a subpopular uh, subpopulation in australia that are among the um, few remaining viable populations but even they have declined and the species no longer occurs in new south wales they received a level of protection in australia bangladesh bahrain um, india qatar malaysia indonesia south africa and the united um, arab emirates but this enforcement is often lacking, so they are protected, but obviously it doesn't help them sometimes. Uh, all species of sawfish are listed as CITES Appendix 1, so these guys are restricted pretty much in their trade. So you've got to be very careful when you're trading these big uh, sawfish. And small numbers have luckily been kept in aquariums, with about 13 individuals uh, with stud books in North America, um, 6 individuals in Europe, and 2 individuals in Japan. So they could potentially start a breeding population, but really it's much better to conserve these guys in the wild considering their habitats and things like that. Sadly, as I mentioned, critically endangered, but hopefully there's um, some programs that ho help them return to parts of their natural range and also help them, and also basically education to show that um, Asian medicines, and this is not, not only just to fix these guys, I think it's rhinos, elephants, things like that, shark fin soup, um, elephant ivory tiger um 
tiger um, bones and things like that really just really hurts these species because people believe in these superstitious nonsense medicines and luckily there's a lot of education going on in um, China and people are starting to learn that this is not actually working this is just superstitious nonsense but um yeah we're going to move on to the next one. Uh, we've got last but most, certainly not least, we've got the Indo-Pacific Sailfish. So this is done by Leaf, Jen, Buffsu, and Neotenic, I believe how you say that name. So really excited to get stuck into these guys. Uh, big swim over here for these guys. Really, really awesome. So I think they're going for food now. But anyway, uh, these guys are a type of raven fish. They're a type of billfish. And their name in Greek means um, sail, uh, to carry sail. Which is pretty interesting. So these guys are marine fish. Uh, they are pelagic and oceanic, so the Oceanodromus. So they typically wide, uh, widely range across the ocean. Um, these guys have typically found at depths between uh, zero to two hundred meters, and are usually found at about thirty meters. They are considered subtropical to tropical, so they're like um, warm to semi-warm waters. Uh, they live in, in the Indo-Pacific, so the Indian Pacific Ocean, and tropical to temperate waters from about 45 to 50 degrees north and 40 to 35 degrees south. And in the Western Pacific, uh, 35 to 35 north and south in the Eastern Pacific, and typically in those ranges until it gets too cold. Um, they also entered the Mediterranean Sea versus, versus the, um, from the Red U via the Suez Canal. They're also highly migratory, and it shows that these guys are... Uh, believe that these guys may be a single worldwide species um exoprobus um platyteris but it's uh, typically these guys are kind of now split into two with the indo-pacific um sailfin and the atlantic sailfin as they people often recognize as the differences between them so there could be potentially up to two uh two species but some people lump them into one we're just going to be going with the two species model here so we talk about the end of pacific uh these guys get quite big their range is typically about 150 centimeters or so and um, the maximum length is about 348 centimeters or about three meters or so um male and sex length with a common length about 270 centimeters and a maximum published weight of about 100 kilograms so quite a big fish and they have a maximum reported age of about 13 years so these guys are quite interesting, as you can see here. The species is distinguished from this quite long body like other billfish have that allow them to be fast pursuit predators. They also have this very high um, sail-like dorsal fin, as you can kind of see here, that's really characteristic of the species. And they also have like no gill rakers, things like that. They have this really long bill here where they get the name the billfish. It's almost like a marlin. Another really interesting thing about them. So in terms of their biology, these guys are oceanic or um, epipelagic species, and they're typically found above the thermocline. Uh, most densely distributed in waters close to coastal islands, and they're most likely shoal by size, and undergoes spawning migrations in the Pacific, so they will move into areas to spawn. So imagine uh, tropical waters is a particularly good place. These guys are quite generous. They feed on crustaceans, fishes, and cephalopods. And they're caught typically by um, long lines, set nets, or sometimes trolling or um, harpooning from boats. And they're usually um, utilized freeze, uh, fresh, smoked, or frozen. And they're used in sashimi and sushi. And it can be eaten, boiled, and baked. So they're quite a common fish for people to eat. Um, seen as um, Seems to spawn throughout the year in tropical and subtropical waters of the Pacific. And they typically will... Peak spawning occurs around the local uh, summer seasons, so typically when it's summer they'll breed the most. Spawning occurs with males and females swimming in pairs, or with two or three males chasing a single female, probably a mating behavior. The ripe um, ovarian eggs are about 0.85 millimeters in diameter, and they have no structure other than a viscous membrane are untransparent. And the eggs are from captured females from the Indian Ocean are a little bit bigger, about 1.3 millimeters in diameter. So luckily these guys are considered uh, least concerned, they're still quite common. But things like overfishing and um, over, um, because they're both a commercial and a game fish, because it was mentioned they're eating a lot, that can dis uh, affect the populations. But at the moment they seem least concerned and then there's other things like um, plastic in the ocean, po uh, pollution, a lot of those issues apply more broadly but don't really particularly impact the species. But yeah, still quite common and um, quite tasty, it seems, since people like to eat them. And I just think they look so cool. They're very fast fish, like other marlins. They can swim very, very fast to catch prey, things like that. And they use their long um, 
bill here to kind of stun them, which is really, really awesome. They don't really spare them. But yeah, really, really awesome fish, and well done to Leaf, Buff Su, um, uh, Jen, uh, and the Aesthetic. And before I go, I want to make sure I get the credit, the um, ocean, uh, green sawfish. So these guys were made by Leaf, Buff Su, and V. Varena, I believe you say that, but everyone really today has done a really wonderful job. Of course, I put everyone's... Um, uh, credits in the description so you want to see who makes them then everyone hopefully feels credited because i want to make sure everyone is recognized for the wonderful mods that they'd be making so um yeah i think this would be a very very great place to end the video so i really 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 hope you guys enjoyed this video I hope you guys like and subscribe always remember to hit the little bell icon to get notified blown anything so yeah hopefully you guys enjoyed this video hope you guys like and subscribe and bye bye